Hi, it's Dr. Catherine D. Harris, English 10 Great Works of Literature, Techno Literature, Department of English, San Jose State. This is our next lecture dealing with um, Victor Frankenstein and the creature in starting in Chapter 4, Volume 1, and then also getting into a little Volume 2. At the conclusion of this lecture, I'll have the second half of your blog post prompt. You should put them all together. Okay. The tag for today should be technology, and I'll remind you of that again. So what we see in at the conclusion towards the end of Volume 1, and in Chapter 4 especially, is that it's a live moment. And I just asked you to blog about how technology in that particular it's a live moment shapes Victor Frankenstein's character for the rest of the novel. We see him uh, as he exists in interaction with Robert Walton, so he's a little bit demented and haggard and tired, and he seems to be on death's door, and he's narrating his life through those eyes. Let's keep remembering that as a narration. Now chapter four, that very first moment where we know that Victor has used the ideas of Agrippa, sort of a natural philosophy and electricity in order to bring about what he considers a perfect race of human beings that will no longer be subjected to disease. He basically wants to save his mother in retrospect. She dies prior to much prior to this and so he he essentially is a good son but where did he go wrong so just before chapter 4 it's on page 36 of our longman edition the second edition the 1818 version the very top of the page victor is recounting why he's going through this process in the first place uh, he says a human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never to allow passion or transitory desire to disturb his tranquility. I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. He's let his passions carry himself away. And he continues in volume 1, chapter 4, on page 37. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning, the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull, yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and convulsive motion agitated its limbs." How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? How deline delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful. Great God, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. That's it. There is no it's alive moment. There is no moment where he wheels himself up to the top of the place and, and puts eels all over the, the creature or electrifies it or melts it and then remelts it in a witch's cauldron. He describes it as utterly beautiful, unnatural, and ugly with shriveled skin. This is the creature's fate. He will never change. He's created a super race that will never grow old, that's incredibly strong, as immune to, to disease. So technology here and science here has allowed Victor to create something that won't be subjected to technology any longer. And Victor writes all of this down in a notebook and then loses that notebook because he's fallen ill. Here's the thing that's striking. We have the correlation of passion and science and technology and power and knowledge and education all come together, but Victor sees the error of his ways when he sees the creature open its eyes and he falls ill and decides that he has to exit reality and can no longer deal with it. In this particular moment, he goes mad and he's narrating it in retrospect, so he's narrating this madness. He recognizes it as madness, but it's too late. The creature is alive. What do we do now? Here's what I want to say about the creature, and going into volume two, I'm really curious 
How many of you still think that the creature is a victim? Um, I asked you before, do you call it a creature or a monster? And I'd be interested to know if you still call it a creature or if you're now calling it a monster because there's some murders that happens of Justine, of a little boy who didn't deserve it, those victims. And later we're going to see somebody else who dies as well. It's coming, but I have no spoilers. The creature itself was an unnatural birth because it was created by a man, not a woman. He wasn't born. Uh, there was no vaginal canal to go through. There was no labor pains. Uh, the version of labor pains was Victor feeling passion. There's no mother. He existed without incubation. He's only as a thought, the creature in Victor's head. We hear history in volume two and especially in chapter three about everything that happened. Uh, the creature was created four years after Victor Frankenstein began school. That means Victor was 21. Uh, the creature roamed around for two years before killing William. Uh, in, and Victor Frankenstein was 23. He's described as a savage and a fiend by Victor. He's dejected and detested by Victor. He has no guidance like Victor had, even just a minuscule amount. He never felt love, the creature. He calls himself a mon monster in volume two. He speaks French, but he also speaks English. And later on, um, he's going to speak one other language, I think Italian as well. Uh, he's The rest of the narrative is in French, I think, because Victor is um, from Geneva, and so he would, his natural language would be French, but it's translated into English. The creature declares, declares that revenge is really the way that he uh, would like to get back at Victor. He wants Victor to live in the way that he did. The creature uses archaic language. The way that he picks up um, humanity uh, and good and evil is by reading John Milton's Paradise Lost. If you've never read Paradise Lost, you could take a moment to look up an excerpt or look it up on Wikipedia. It's about the fall from grace and it's about humanity. It's not necessarily uh, about Satan himself. But the creature identifies with Satan in um, Paradise Lost, which is an odd thing to do. He learned to speak from Milton's Paradise Lost, and he was reading it in French, so his language is very archaic. He associates himself with Satan because Satan was kicked out of sanctuary, and the creature thinks that he was as well when he met the De Lacy family. And he's outside of the family dynamic itself. Mary Shelley used Milton as an example of great writing, but it's also a commentary upon, upon Milton's plot. Okay, this is where we stop and we go back to a historical moment. One of the great classical uh, literary people of all time to the 18th and 19th century authors was John Milton and his Paradise Loss, as well as Shakespeare himself. So by Mary Shelley referencing Milton, she's demonstrating that she too has an education and understands these philosophical stances, as well as uh, engaging with her own mother's uh, philosophy too. When we get to volume two, we get a plethora of children everywhere. In fact, what we get in volume two is a leaving behind of technology almost completely, and Victor retreats to nature as if he needs some sort of restoration. Every time he falls ill, Henry's there or Elizabeth is there, and they take him out into the woods and he restores himself. And the thing is that that sets up the entire novel to be either technology and science or nature. One of those represents good and advancement and culture and, and humanity itself. The other represents uh, unabashed passion. But the thing is that nature in the 18th and 19th century often represented the wild. So here we have a melding. Nature and technology and science, can they all go together to be used for benevolence? And so the place where we actually start with all of these things, this idea of benevolence, is with the common denominator of children, tabula rasa. We have the creature despite its size, and though it seems like an anti-child, is really a child. We have Elizabeth in her early years is described as a puppy dog. We have Victor, who also starts out as a child, and we're introduced to his youth as he's 14 and 15. We have Justine, who is one of our servants, and she, of course, is killed because the servants get killed. And then we have William, Victor's younger brother, who is also strangled to death by the creature. All right. So what I would like you to do in reference to volume two 
is go back and watch Thomas Edison's full film of Frankenstein. Uh, and we didn't watch the second half. And here's what I would like you to do in your blog post. This is the second half of it. In the very same blog post, I want you to answer this question. Is the creature portrayed accurately in the short film? Is the creature portrayed accurately in Thomas Edison's 1910 version of Frankenstein? Why or why not use specific details? The tag for this particular post in, in the two parts is going to be technology. And let me just re rephrase for you the first blog post, the first part of this blog post. How does technology in that it's a live moment shape Victor Frankenstein's character? Okay. So two halves to the single blog post.